Buddy, it's Thursday. Happy to see you all in here into the regular live stream that we do every single Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I know the clocks are still different um, in the UK and in Europe in general, so some people still haven't gotten used to the time change. It is what it is. We should be getting good audio. I'm checking in here. Yeah, we're good. And I already see Markleford. If we talked about my grandfather, it would be a three-star general. Congratulations. It's quite the accolade. Hello from Serbia again. <laughs> and hello, Greg and the gang as well. Today, if you look behind me, you can see it's, 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 I got kind of a funky setup going on because I started before I, I turned this on. I had to remove everything around. The lighting's all weird because of this. Uh, I'm filming the before and after with the tube, with the preamp tube to see if I can get a little more headroom out of the gremlin because with, with humbuckers, it's just there's none. There's none. I, I still think it's like the best single coil amp ever. Uh, if you liked uh, the blackface fender kind of tones, but you don't want to buy a fender. Uh, but uh, humbuckers, it's just the five watts, it's, it's not enough. So I don't know the results yet. We only filmed the first half. Now I'm letting the amp cool down and discharge. And then after this, I'm going to rapidly <laughs> uh, take the, the V1 preamp tube out, which is the 12AX7, and throw in the 12AU7. And we'll see how it goes. Uh, that won't be for tomorrow's video, and that won't even be for the video after that, because those two are already filmed. Tomorrow we have the tournament, um, getting down to the last, how many guitars do we end up at? I think four. Yeah, I think tomorrow brings us to the last four guitars. And then after that, I have a video where I finally fixed the super thin line deluxe Telecaster up properly. It's got the right pick guard on it. Uh, I built it a new wiring harness. It started off as an Emerson one, but it wasn't going to work out. So I got creative with the solder and the Lollertron pickups. So you'll hear before and afters of that and maybe some extra sound samples, depending on how much time I have to make additional stuff for that video, because some people have said that they want to hear more instrumentation with it. My problem is just trying to have the time to artificially loop things and artificially make uh, other instrumentation. It's very foreign to me still, even though I know how to do it, and I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I, I really wish I was healed up and I could just play the drums like I did on some other demos we used to do on this channel. But I digress. It's better than nothing. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, Robert, Paul, Joey, Corey. So, giving you the game plan on that. So, th yeah, that's three videos right there. And... Yeah, it's been it's been strange not having my kid home from school. It feels like she was home for like three weeks. So I, I've been trying to get as much as I can done, done. And it, it's weird. Sometimes you forget to, to practice guitar. So what I want to ask you guys today, we're going to start off with a general poll here. It's not about gear. You believe that or not? There you go. You can do it. Actually, practice guitar once a day, every few days. Okay, I only got four slots open, but I'm interested to see where you guys are at on this. I ask you, how often do you actually practice guitar? Before you answer it, in case you already haven't, I'm talking about really practice. Not pick up your guitar and noodle around or just whatever. You want to play along with other songs or just have fun. Uh, it's a different thing than sitting down and actually actively practicing to improve or to maintain your chops. To me, at least. So do you do it once a day, a few times a week, uh, maybe once a month or so, or You'd rather not say is basically the the last answer here. What is practice? San Sebastian. That's great. Uh, I, I miss Spain. I loved Spain. I have a guitar hanging on the wall that I bought 
in a little shop in Madrid. That acoustic up there. I bought that. Um, what year was that? 2000? Ah, 24 years ago. Yeah. Just a tiny little acoustic shop in Spain. A really, really cool spot. Uh, and I remember playing on the sidewalk there. And that was amusing for a multitude of reasons. Because at the time, I wasn't of legal drinking age in America, but I was of legal drinking age in Europe. <laughs> so I remember going to lunch. We, 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 we drank a little bit. And I, I just started playing the guitar. And people were so cool. Like, they were just hanging out and, and clapping and just dancing around. It's not like that everywhere in the world. But I did enjoy that. I did enjoy that. I'd love to go back to um, Madrid at some point in my life. Although I've been to, to both coasts before. I didn't like uh, Barcelona as much. <laughs> oh, man. So a lot of you are saying once a day here. All right, that's really good. I'm happy to see that. I'm really happy to see that. And do you, do you actually stretch before? I, I that, that that's the other topic of the, of the really the day here is stretching and the importance of it because I I, I felt the other day I, I I really really was going at it with 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 the metronome and, and pushing myself and I what I thought I was doing or the purpose of the exercise was I was trying to work on my right hand but really my left hand was the one that started to to cramp up and start to hurt and I was like oh I, I didn't stretch I always stretch and I just been so out of the loop forgot to do it but it worked itself out I stretch and now I'm stretching again every time that I get to sit down and actually practice but filming YouTube and and editing for YouTube and all that it's really time consuming <laughs> so that little free time I do get at the end of every night um, I got to make the most of it it is what it is if I'm watching on YouTube, I still have a guitar in my hands. Best way to justify sitting on my ass in front of a screen. Yeah, that's that's really solid. The only time I really watch YouTube is if I'm doing something else. And then I'm more so listening to YouTube. So I think we share a similar kind of mindset there. Yeah, I, I like working on things. I like working on guitars and listening to YouTube. I don't I don't necessarily like the just staring at the screen either. Makes me feel very unproductive and lazy. Although, you know, sometimes you need to turn your brain off. Musician's Friend is having a decent in-cart sale on some brands. Uh, an Epiphone 59 Les Ball with the Burst Buckers, 675 Great guitar new at that price. What do they sell for new? A grand? I think so, right? All those things are crazy priced. I... Maybe in the American market, that's a decent price. That's a that's a garbage price. <laughs> I'm getting a Japanese made guitar for, for for that brand new, and I'm sorry, it's a no brainer to me. But I'm in the minority, and I'm weird. I accept all of that. I accept all of that. <laughs> How would you describe having a Tele with the lower Tron style pickups? Is it still as useful for different genres? It's it's interesting. Because it still sounds like a Telecaster. You wouldn't think so because it doesn't have the bridge. It's got a hardtail bridge that's not connected to the bridge pickup in the way that a regular Telecaster would. And also, it's a fil uh, Filtertron style pickups. Well, really, they are actual Filtertrons now versus single coils. But it still has that like Tele thing. The biggest difference for me... I feel like I can almost cover other spaces that I wouldn't be able to cover a little bit better. Specifically, rock, if I'm only going to use one guitar, and, and part of the reason I was, as I was mentioning earlier about writing to pre-made music, I'm trying to have like a one-minute song that I'm working on with that guitar for part of the demo. If it doesn't get done for the actual demo video, 
Um, it'll get just posted on its own whenever I get around to finishing it. But I find that when it's just the one guitar, having the Fidelitron, is, it's a lot bigger sounding than just a Tele bridge pickup. So I don't need to double stack guitars or do anything um, to kind of make it sound a little bit bigger. Because a Telecaster sits in a mix really well with a ton of other instruments. Obviously, it's like one of the best recording guitars, if not the best recording guitar of all time. But if you don't have a lot of instruments in an arrangement, and in case of the one that I'm currently working on, there is one bass guitar. It'll just be the one guitar played in a few uh, different kind of ways in positions so that you can hear what it sounds like, and the drums. So I don't need something that like is going to sit as well within a, amongst rather a bunch of other instruments. And for that, I think it's really cool. So like in a three piece, if you're playing just a straight up little three piece or a trio, I think it'd be a great guitar for that. But it makes me play a little bit differently. I enjoy it. I really, 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 really enjoy it. It sounds so much better. It really is. It is a night and day difference between uh, those Fidelitrons, which are not really Filtertron style at all, and the, the Lollertrons. The Lollertrons are fantastic. And I touch on this in the video. They are not cheap. And Lawler did not send me these. They're not cheap. But my God, I'd do it again. You're not an SG guy, so what's your recommendation for a lightweight HH guitar? Hmm. You're right, I'm not an HH guy. But if you want something lightweight, depends how much... Well, well, first of all, where are you in the world? You're in Serbia. I knew that before I answered it. I would check out an Edwards. Edwards guitars, I'm fairly sure you should be able to get those there. And some of those are really light. Like, I saw... An Edwards Les Paul come up for sale. That's beautiful. Like Les Paul custom appointments and the the Seth Lover pickups, Seymour Duncan's, that was under three kilograms. Very light. Gorgeous guitar. And a few of the other Edwards I've had have been around, not that light, but like 3.3 kilos, kilograms. So much more manageable. Outside of that, uh, I don't know if you if you could find a seventy seven. That's the best lightweight HH guitar I've ever had. You you don't have a ton of super light options. Like there are some PRS guitars that are going to be very light, like the the Bella, the the PRS Bella. It's the S two. That's a pretty light guitar, but that's a single and a humbucker. You'd have to actually buy a second humbucker but really if you were going to buy one of those i would tell you to just buy two humbuckers and yeah i I, I would look for an edwards that's just me you start with the metronome and finger exercise for five minutes there you go the metronome is your best friend it prepares you for so much in life it really does and that's one of the reasons i was so happy to start with the drums I had to play to him. I had to play to a metronome. And it was more vital for me to be in time as the drummer. I will never forget this. Well, this is for a multitude of reasons, but the first time I ever went into an actual like real recording studio with a real console, I was I was either 15 or 16 years old. And I'd already been playing drums for like when did I start when I was I was either 9 or 10, I feel like. But the point being, I was really well trained. And when we went in, we were still recording to tape. And the bassist in that band, um, he, he did not have the talent. Let's just say that. Really great guy, but he had the look. So all the girls wanted to come see our band because he looked like an Abercrombie and Fitch model at the time. Um, but when it came to recording, he really needed the drums to be like uh, uh, right on right on. I couldn't really be pushing the beat and I, I couldn't be dragging. I had to be right in line with the click and it helped him out a lot. And even the engineer said, he's just like, he's like, yeah, man. He's just like, he's like, that's, 
if you ever remember one thing, as long as you keep doing this, he's like, stay as consistent as you are now, as far as holding the beat. He's like, it's not about anything with fills or fancy stuff. He's like, none of that shit matters. Uh, you, you have to be the backbone of the band. And thankfully, when I did switch over to playing guitar, because I didn't like the style of music that we were playing with that band, that stuck with me. And I ended up really liking funk guitar. And here we are. So all that cool syncopation and all of that is just bored out of being a drummer and really practicing with the metronome first. That's the fun stuff I'm talking about. You start with an old piece I know, then practice learn scales. Then I learn a new piece. Occasionally, I'll play random songs to help train your ears. Ear training is super important. Ear training is super important. I remember I would, Greg would know this too. Actually, I don't know if Greg would know this. I don't know if they had this when at the time when I went, at the time when he went. Uh, we both went to the same uh, recording school, but they had an actual ear training course. And you would basically hear like sine waves of all of the notes. And it, it was, it was legit. So like I have things like ingrained in my head where if I hear like certain beeps, it, it kind of like gives me like a, uh, like a trigger. And it brings me right back to all of that uh, oral training, A-U-R-A-L training for your ears and note identification and just picking out scales or, or picking out keys rather, not scales, picking out the key that you're in. And all of that, like really quickly being able to identify, all right, what key am I in? Um, what is this a two five one? What's going on here? This is major, this is minor. You, you pick it out really quick. But training your ears to do that can help you so much. And even if you don't know as much about like theory, like deep, if you have a general idea about theory and your ears can hear all of that well and identify it on the go, you'll be able to pick up songs extremely quickly. And that's a really valuable tool to have. Whether you're just playing by yourself for fun or you're collaborating with other people or God forbid, if you're playing with improv, that's like a mandatory thing. Because if somebody shouts something at you in a language you don't understand, in this case music, if they shout uh, the numeric values and they tell you the key or they just assume that you know it based on you, you watching them and you're lost, that's not good. You're not going to do very well performing on the go. Which is really sad. And uh, who was it? I think it was Steve Lukather was being interviewed. And I'm not sure how old this interview was. But he was talking about how a lot of the magic is gone with performing live now. And you don't see as many people go up on stage and just start playing. Because everyone has their, their stupid phone out all the time. And people are so afraid of making a mistake or botching something, even like Steve, who is one of the best guitarists in the world. And they don't want it to become like a viral thing because that's what happens. How many times does that stuff happen? Somebody goes on stage, they have a screw up moment. And depending on how famous they are, like that could really, that hurts them. And then you just factor in all the, the crap of the anonymous people on YouTube or Instagram or wherever watching a clip saying how trash the person is. Meanwhile, you know, they've never done anything with their lives. It's just musicians are fragile people. Yeah, that just bums me out that you don't see that as much. Because I used to see that all the time. And I used to do that. Going up and playing, you would just sit in. Sit in and just play. You know, let's play a few songs. And a lot of people aren't doing it as much as they used to. That just made me really bummed out. <laughs> But it's true. Practicing in general, like if you, if you, and what's the most important thing is not necessarily um, what you said, Joey. The most important thing about what you said and tells me that you're, you're serious about it is you actually have a plan. You have specific things that you're doing. That's key to, to practicing efficiently as well. Is to not just say, all right, I'm going to practice today and then kind of sit down and be like, well, what am I going to practice? And you turn on the metronome and you're, you're running through pentatonics. Technically, you practice, but did you, did you practice with purpose? What are you trying to improve? And based on what you're saying, oral training, that's the biggest thing that you're going to get out of that. And that's awesome. Good stuff. Hello, Sean. Oh, Sean, I thought you... I read that wrong. You still haven't bought anything yet in 2024. 
but you're jonesing for a Fender Custom Shop Tele in two-tone sungers, sunburst, sunburst, uh, maple board, only three kilograms. Well, I'll tell you what. It's, it's a two-tone sunburst. It's automatically disqualified. I can't let you do that. Sunbursts are only allowed if it's truly a vintage instrument and it's the original finish. That's the end. So you're not going to buy it. Goodbye. You play every day. Not sure if that's counting as practice, mind you. See, but that's what I mean, Polly. That's exactly what I mean. Because I'd like to, I'd like to hope everybody who watches guitar YouTube in any capacity, whether it's, it's this channel or any other channel, obviously you have a deep love for the instrument. Uh, I, I would really hope that at some point throughout the day that you would find time to at least just play for a few minutes on your own whether it has a purpose or not. Then, you know, sometimes life happens and you might miss a few days for whatever reasons, but got to do it. Follow-up about the Lollertrons. Would you rather these mount on a thin... Hold on, let me read this right. Follow-up question about Lollertrons. Would you rather mount these on a thin line style body or a regular tele body style, uh, Cabernet style? I don't... I think they work well on either one. Based on my experience with this style of pickup too, and I've had Cabernitas, and obviously I have the super thin line. I've played regular Cabernitas that have had the Fidelitrons. I've had regular Cabernitas that have had TV Jones um, classic pickups. And I've played, what was the other ones, other set of pickups I had that were that style? I didn't have it, but I played it. Uh, Seymour Duncan's. Cyclones. I did try those briefly too. I liked them. Like I, I feel like Tellys are such a good match for that style of pickup. Very underrated. And if you're somebody who's like put off by the size of a Gretsch guitar for whatever reason, just grab yourself a grab yourself a lightweight Telly, and throw in a set of a uh, Lollertrons or Fralintrons or whatever TV Jones. Whatever you 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 decide on as far as the brand goes, as long as they're actual Filtertron style pickups, you, you you're going up the right alley. Okay. Lower priced acoustic guitar pickups. My band might found a nice maple 1970s acoustic at a thrift shop. Looking for a lower cost pickup, K and K, but those might need a preamp. Those, uh, the majority of those I believe do need a preamp. And I'm gonna be honest. You know I'm the wrong person to ask for this, and you know who the right person to ask is now, don't you, Rex? I'm not the acoustic guitar guy. Why don't you all go check out Aaron Short? Let's give a let's give Aaron a a free plug here. Cause he he's a cool guy, and he is Mr. Acoustic. So when it comes to that stuff, there's nobody you're gonna get a bore qualified answer from that will actually respond to you I'm sure there's other people but okay here you go there you go go subscribe to, to Aaron tell him I said hello I hope he's doing well up in the the absolute war zone that is New York City <laughs> you practice every day of healthy titanium pan plate in the hands just don't forget feel yeah. That's the worst thing when when you when you have a health reason that 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 stops you from being able to play as much as you want. Uh but you're fighting through it, man. You're fighting through it and you do what you got to do. It's all that matters. Nicest person you ever met was Leo Tan Dupree, Jack's daughter, Michael Coleman asked me to play Don't Say No. I did. I regret to not learn about a potential screw up. You learn more from screwing up and it will stick with you more than nailing something. And I'm going to tell you something that to this day still bothers me from when I was a, when I was a kid. It was one of my first live performances. I was the drummer. And we were playing, it was really hot in, in the place that we were playing. And it was like middle of, well, it wasn't the middle of summer. It was like right as the summer was starting. And sweat, 
basically is what I'm getting at, at the hands. We were at a song that was definitely up-tempo, uh, maybe like 192 BPM. And I'll, I'll never forget the moment I dropped my stick because it just it slipped out of my right hand. Now, I was able to maintain where I, I knew that not many people would notice unless they're really paying attention. And I covered with my left hand and I didn't stop playing the kick or the snare. And I just, I reached behind me. I got another stick. I kept going. But after that show, one of my best friends at that time came up to me and he said, he's just like, you screwed up, man. He's like, I noticed that. He's like, he's like, I thought you were practicing. You you busted my balls. I'll tell you, I was pissed. (laughs) I was mad. He also played drums too at the time too. So it was extra like, oh, really? You want to go there right now? I was the one playing tonight. You were the one in the, in the crowd. <laughs> but my point being, what I took away from that is just like, do not ever drop your stick again. And I've never forgotten that one little experience. Now, th- I, there's got to have been one or two other times where I've made small mistakes w- w- on the drums. But that that really stuck with me. So yeah, the moral of that story is Unless you actually do something and you take a chance on failing or you do something and you fail while doing it, you know, you might not learn a lesson like that or you might not get something like really ground into your skull. It's one thing to have somebody on YouTube tell you or even like a pro tell you some like perfect sage advice. When you're the actual one going through that experience, just like anything else in life, it hits you harder when it happens to you. So be more open to all sorts of things when it comes to music. Don't be afraid of screwing up. Don't be afraid of sounding like crap. Guys, I got people telling me I suck at guitar in different languages in the YouTube comment section. <laughs> it is what it is sometimes. You know, ne- you're never going to make everyone happy. So just to, to have fun and enjoy it. And don't be afraid of, of messing up. What camera do I use? Uh, you're having a real trouble getting a decent oh i'm having real trouble with this chula vista california san diego no thank you uh getting decent quality with your either older iphone or even a 4k camcorder i don't have expense enough software to fix it in post you don't you shouldn't worry about fix it in post what are you editing in are you editing in final cut are you editing in premiere are you editing in iMovie what are you using to edit? Are you using Vegas? All of these things are going to impact my answer on that. Because I know just enough about all this editing stuff to know nothing. But to answer the question, right now we are using a Sony ZV-1. And that is the primary camera that I use these days. I still have a Sony A5100, like the super OG camera. But uh, it dies after 20 minutes of recording. And the HDMI port's broken on it. So that's why I don't stream on that camera anymore. It's more used for stills when I want to take pictures of gear. If I want to make it look extra, extra special for the listing. (laughs) Can't play surf music without the clams. Yeah. Oh, I was, that was fun stuff, man. I love surf. Good morning. Good morning. Love your channel, especially the demos, the ES335 and Jazzmaster. Watch for the first time from San Francisco. Oh, it's great, man. I'm really happy to hear that. I'm trying to think of the, the 335 and the Jazzmaster. Did I ever play those together in the same video? Chat. <laughs> Can you guys help me out on that one? Have I ever done that? Because we are going to be making two two videos that have a humbucker guitar against a single coil guitar. That for some reason, because of the way this bracket worked out, I thought it was inevitable one of them would happen. No, what happened was all the Fenders got put on the top end of the bracket. All the Gibsons and the cheap guitars got put on the bottom of the bracket. So there weren't really many interesting matchups between the two of them. Just the nature of the luck of the draw, I suppose. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be the telly against either the 335 
or the Les Paul. And then whichever one I don't match the telly with, it'll be either the Jazz Master or the Strat against the other one. Just for fun. Because I like comparison videos that don't make sense. And I was really bummed that I didn't get to do any of those odd ones. The one tomorrow killed me. I had to do the telly against the Jazz Master. That hurt my soul. But anyways, regardless, I appreciate that. Thank you for your wise counsel. I've actually never heard that reasoning about the sunburst, but I like it, and so does my wallet. See, I will help you save money unless you want to buy. See, you know what? I don't like you, Sean, because if you were here in America, you know what I would have you do? I'd sell you the Friedman, and I'd sell you that double-bound white Telecaster. And what are you looking at? You're, you're looking at a guitar for three grand? You'd have both, and you'd still have a grand left in your pocket, and you'd have an amp and a guitar. Yeah. And it wouldn't be a sunburst guitar. Custom Telecaster, man. <laughs> Free version of Resolve. Okay. Make sure when you're in your, your your initial settings, when you set up, first of all, have, a, have an extra hard drive that you're saving all of your uh, sessions into when you're making your, your video edits. When you're doing that, in your actual video settings, make sure you're not capping yourself out or selling yourself out short. That's a problem that a lot of people make because they don't think to check it. Because believe it or not, something like your phone, like my wife has an iPhone 13. It's like three years old at this point. You could still get really good, like more than good enough video quality to film for YouTube on something like that as long as your lighting isn't garbage which will be my second point, but make sure you go into the actual setting of the software that you're using and have it optimized for as high as a resolution and a frame rate, an FPS, that is maxed out to what your camera is capable of. Because something that's in 1080 but has like 60 frames per second is going to look a lot smoother than something that's at 4K and... 30 frames per second, you'll notice it as much, but if it gets a little bit lower than that, the point being, you notice that. So the FPS matters a lot to how good your quality is going to be. And then the last thing I just alluded to, make sure you have good lighting. Lighting is paramount. When I first started doing YouTube and people were like, man, you you have like pretty decent quality stuff. Like, I, what are you using for gear? I'm using to this day still one of these... $10 Amazon lights that's lighting me up right now. And I was using an already outdated Sony camera that does not do 4K. It still maxes out at 1080. And I was just throwing it into Final Cut. But I made sure my lighting was okay. And that my ISO settings and aperture were fixed. And we were good. Hey Jim, what do you think of the wet dry or wet dry wet? I have two amps. And it would be fun to keep using them both and experiment with a different, discover a different sound. 15 in Princeton Reverb. I'll tell you what's funny, man. <laughs> Two weeks ago, I filmed the video. I wasn't happy with it. I sat over there and I did a wet dry video. My first one. With the Vox and the Tone King. Now, I let Ian hear some of the results of that. And we were both laughing because I'd never done it before. And it was wild. Um, but it's really, it, in the room, super cool. On recording, it did, it did not come out the way I, I wanted to. So it's, it's a process. You got to figure out what you're doing. But to get to your point, I think they're fun. And I think that those are two great amps to use together. The biggest problem I had with using the Gremlin with the AC-15 was the AC-15 is just far more powerful than the Gremlin. You're talking about 15 watts versus five and mixing them together so that in the room I'm pushing the Vox a little bit because the Vox, it sounds really sterile unless you, you give it a little, the tube is a little bit of work to do. If you're not pushing the tubes, the Vox can sound like a very sterile amp. However, to get there, you're overpowering the Gremlin by a lot. So in my case, they're not a good match together. But a Princeton at 12 watts, you'd be in, you'd be in heaven. 
which one would you use for the wet and which one would you use for the dry? Or would you do, you know what I'd like to do? You have the Princeton with just the reverb. That's it. And then you have all your pedal effects as far as time-based. Uh, and really for me, I would I would only throw modulation to the one amp. I'd throw all my drives to the Princeton and just use the reverb on the Princeton. I'm pointing like I have a Princeton. I do not. No, there's not a Princeton in this house. But then I'd have all the other stuff going to the Vox. I think that'd be a really good pair. That'd be fun. So give it a shot. Give it a shot. See, good, great, great minds think alike. You're good. Uh, wet, dry, wet though. That that's a bridge too far for me. Just just give me the two amps. And the most important thing to do, if you're gonna record yourself, just make sure that you're you're, you're compensating for phase, or you're taking phase into consideration. Because if you have phase issues, you might open up your DAW and be like, "This sounds like garbage," and you might think, "Oh no, this is just not gonna work." You might just have to click the phase button on one of the preamps and you'll be good. <laughs> Makes a big difference. Light and tripod. Fit your stuff to the space. Back to the feel, eh, bro? Yeah, I mean, and again, that's the other thing about YouTube. W the first, like, four months of videos I made was in a 100-square-foot room. And my wife and I's bed was in the same room. I literally had a I had this tiny desk. I had the drums, electronic drums shoved in the corner. I had the few guitars hanging up on the wall behind me. I didn't have room for a stand. The one little lamp and then it, enough room for a chair and me. The bed was the entire rest of the room. And the only reason we were all cool with it was because when we were broken down and the, the, the chair was pushed into the desk, we had the screen door that let us out to the backyard. So it didn't feel as like jail cell-ish. So, yeah, you don't need a lot. You don't need top gear to do YouTube. And one thing I will say that it took me watching a video that had great video but terrible audio to understand this and really put focus on it. Um, when you're filming an actual video, like with live streams, stuff happens. Like right now, my preamp is set up to work with that mic. I didn't, I didn't think to go back in and adjust it for this stream because I, I, I don't want to adjust it because I already filmed half of it with that. But your audio is so much more important. Your audio quality is so much more important than the video quality. And viewers care way more about that. If you have a video that looks amazing, but it sounds just, just horrible... People are going to click out immediately. You can get away with the other way around, though. And sometimes people think it's endearing. They're like, oh, this guy's got terrible production. He must be telling the truth. <laughs> I'm serious. I've actually had that comment before. <laughs> General rule of thumb is the amp with the most headroom is the wet amp. But there's no rules, right? Yeah. There's no rules with anything. Screw around. <laughs> Try random crap and, and, and throw it at the wall and see what sticks. In my case... Uh, yeah, the Tone King Gremlin with the AC-15, I just think that it's too much. I, I could get it to work, but I'm sacrificing all of the goodness of the AC-15. Because I like that amp a lot. Um, but I got to push it to get it to a spot I like it at. If I play that at like happy bedroom levels, like the, uh, the, the Gremlin it is not a very inspiring sound. But pump it up a little bit, get the, the, the tubes cooking. Fox is awesome. Love him. Uh, you're friends with the sound tech from childhood. I told him to make it work with what I can afford. That's what you have to do, man. That's what you have to do. You have to just make it work, period. Like, we, we create problems for ourselves. For so long, I never thought about gear. After I got the Jazz Master, I had nothing else to think about. All I had to worry about was booking gigs. Because I had a guitar, I knew how to set it up, it stayed in tune, and I wasn't breaking strings. I was like, this is great. And then I just focused on playing gigs, because I had a friend of Princeton. Old Silverface, which I miss dearly. I digress. But that was all I used. 
and I think I used like a few pedals here and there. I think I, I well, I used the Drive Master, which I still have. I've had that since the '90s, and I had the El Capistan for a while, and that was pretty much it. And then sometimes at really small gigs, I would I, I would actually gig with my practice amp which was a Vox AC4, and I would use my Strymon Flint with that. But that was like the extent of my pedal board. And I had a Snark, snark pedal tuner. And I just played. But now it's just like, do you have enough gear to play? What if they needed you to play at a coffee shop, but they don't have a PA system? You also need to accommodate for a singer. Um, are, your in are you going to use in-ears? Or, or, or right after that, you have to go and play a three-piece where they have a decent PA, but you know your app might not have enough headroom. How are you going to make it work? Like I never used to think of any of that shit. <laughs> I just bring the amp, bring the guitar, bring the little pedal board, and you make it work. We, we overcomplicate things as I just spilled my entire water. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Now, you want to play good news, bad news, or bad news, bad news? Here I am having a sage-like moment, and then I pull, I pull that. All because I was trying not to use the dolphin. And I've just made a mess of things. Let me check. Hold on one second. Time out. Oh, God. All right. I think, I think we've averted any serious danger or damage. Unfortunately, though, we have one casualty. Oh, it's really sad. It's one of my kid's characters she drew. It just got soaking wet. Ah, oh, man, I believe that's Bunla. She'll have to draw me another one and cut it out. That sucks. If you had any idea how much art I keep from my kid's collection. <laughs> I love all of it. Anyways, sorry about that. That was a little bit awkward. I'll try and catch up. <laughs> First, let me look at the poll before I do that. I apologize. I'm clearly a, a schizo. Uh, how often do you actually practice guitar? 62% of you say once a day. 25% say every few days. 8% say once a week. 4%, only 4%, that makes me happy to see, say what is practice? What is practice? Damn it. Do you want to know what I thought I broke? And honestly, it wouldn't have been the end of the world because I barely use it, but my wife bought it for me thinking she was like the hero of the day. Uh, a PlayStation 5. Because <laughs> the PlayStation 5's right there. A little bit of water got on the top of it. But, um, yeah. I was like, oh, did I ruin it? Oh, well. <laughs> my wife would have been mad. And there goes my phone. Sometimes life's just not, it, sometimes it's just not your day, man. Sometimes it's just not your day. I'm going to answer a few more questions. You got an Imperial MK2 to replace 68 Custom Pro Reverb. The latter is just way too loud to even gig with. Yeah, Custom Pro Reverb is very loud. You know, I'm having, I was having a problem picking between the Imperial and the Falcon Grande. Now, whenever you watch people talk about Tone King, the Imperial is the amp everyone raves about. Rightfully so. It's a great amp. You never see anyone talk about the Falcon Grande. The Falcon Grande, to me, has a few things about it that the Imperial doesn't have that I really like. One of which you have one additional parameter on the reverb that you can control that, to me, makes a big difference, and that's the dwell. 
On the Imperial, you only get the reverb, the level. On the Falcon Grande, you get the reverb level and the dwell. So you get a lot more of my style, and it'll get you a little bit more, maybe not as splashy as a Fender reverb. And that's the only thing I don't like about the Imperial. That's that's the only thing I don't like about the Imperial. I think the reverb is really weak on it. I think it sounds really weak coming from a silver face Princeton amp. Uh, I think the Falcon Grande you could do a little bit more with. But then again, the Falcon Grande has its problems because, yes, it has rhythm, lead, tweed. Yeah, rhythm, lead, tweed. And those are your three, and the lead is basically like a Supro. However, they're not three independent channels. So if you switch channels from one to the other, uh, there could be a gigantic volume difference between the two of them, and that's not exactly ideal if you want to perform and use all three of those settings. It would be more like a you set it and you forget it via this foot, and then use the foot switch. Whereas if you wanted to with the Imperial, that's a two-channel amp. There's more tubes in the Imperial, and you also get the tremolo in the Imperial. But I believe you only get the two channel options. You get the, the rhythm and the uh, the lead channel on the Imperial, whereas you have three different voicings on the Falcon Grande. I know I've just ranted a lot there. I love Tone King amps, as you can see. Big fan. And I think I've just given myself away. Anyways. Oh, yes, people will tolerate crap video if the audio is clear, but not the opposite. There you go. You had a 79 burst. <laughs> he owed you money. That's awesome. Hey, Matt. How's it going? I actually got to gotta respond to you about something we talked about a few weeks ago. We'll try and set up a day for that. Uh, do you use a pedal to push the AC-15, the brown? The brown amplification protein. Dolphin down. Yeah, that sucked. My friend was the largest collector of Martin. Had no idea that at all. Young age. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I made your day. I wonder how I made your day. <laughs> I, I just had a calamity. So I'm sorry about that. Comedy of errors. Yep. I was on a roll. 100%. Was having a smoke outside. But the audio was horrific sounding. Glad no gear was damaged. Sorry about the picture. That is what it is. It's one drawing. Um, I have binders full of her drawings. I keep everything. And our whole kitchen, all the walls in the kitchen, and then like the whole area around it, it's all stuff from her since we got here. We always hang it up. And we ran out of room, so we started putting it in binders. <laughs> Thanks for keeping it real. Oh, yeah, you have to. Like I said, I've, I've just been... I've been having a really bad day. I, you know what's funny is too. I did again, too much information. I was actually just having a rant on the phone before I got on. I was actually really worked up. Now, I was on the phone with my dad, and before you start thinking to yourself, "What are you yelling at your dad? What are you fighting with your dad about?" I wasn't fighting with my dad. <laughs> I was mad at him. I just having a bit of a rant. <laughs> and sometimes man's just got a rant. And he and I explicitly told him, I'm like, I'm like, I'm not mad at you. I'm like, this has got nothing to do with you. I'm like, this is bullshit. Because what you were talking about was really making me angry. And it's true, but that's life. So literally like one minute before I turned on the stream, I was just like all worked up. And he even said, he's just like, uh, good luck. He's like, good luck on camera. I'm like, yeah, no, I, I'm going to go smile. I'm going to pretend everything's fine. Everything's going to be great. <laughs> and here we are. Yeah, I calm myself down, but at the at what cost? A PlayStation 5 that I don't use. Um, a picture, which is more valuable to me than the PlayStation 5. And I got my shoes soaking wet. That actually sucks. That actually does suck. Spring reverb. You miss Jim? Yeah. The pole. You have guitars everywhere and pick them up daily. Sometimes it adds up to hours, sometimes less. Yeah, there you go. If you can let go of egos and smile when you're playing, you're experiencing fulfillment. Yeah, you just got to <laughs> you just gotta enjoy anything you're doing, man. And you can't have an ego. Because there's always someone better than you. 
No matter how good you are at anything in life, there's some schmuck somewhere else who thinks, and that doesn't even think it, but they're better than you, and you know it, at whatever that skill is. All you can do is just be the best version of yourself. That's how you know I, I'm so lame as a dad. I'm so lame. I try to do all that, and then I just have mental breakdowns, like I, did, like I just did, where everything just fell apart. <laughs> oh my God, my socks are soaking wet. All right, guys. Um, I probably should have tended to this like immediately and, and gone, gotten a towel, but I didn't. I didn't. So what's going to happen now is I'm going to go get a towel and clean this up before I answer this last one. Terrific dad goals, uh, keeping uh, drawings. One day it'll get better. What are you, drunk? Day it'll, one day it'll get better. Pick up your guitar. I'll try my best. <laughs> I'll try my best. And uh, I do have something cool to, to, to mess with in the other room. It's a Tone King amp that isn't the Gremlin. But before I get there, I got to replace the tube in this one after I clean up this water. And then we got to hear if the 12 AU7 is going to make any difference in V1 of the tubes schematic. That's correct. Yeah, V1 of the Gremlin, perhaps giving more headroom to humbuckers. And then when that inevitably does not make me happy enough, I already have the solution in the other room. Thank you all for watching. <laughs> Sorry, this was a mess today. You notice I didn't even put a topic in. I didn't even put a topic in. I was like, I got nothing. But I know I could count on you guys to just talk. So I appreciate that. Have a great day. Enjoy. Don't spill any water on yourself. Don't slam your head on microphones. And practice. Practice. Practice practice. Goodbye now.